All right, we're ready for Galatians 3 and 4. As we mentioned last week, this is kind of a tight schedule to work the book of Galatians in in three studies, but that's what we're doing. Last week, we looked at chapters 1 and 2. We're ready for 3 and 4 today. Chapters 1 and 2 was Paul's defense of his apostleship, showing he did not get his apostleship uh, from man. He didn't receive his message from man. He received the endorsement of the apostles at the Jerusalem discussion, etc. That's chapters 1 and 2. We're ready now for three and four, and these are grouped together in those two chapter units. Uh, chapters one and two deals with the personal matter, this deals with the doctrinal matter, and then we deal with the practical matters in five and six. So we're getting them together as units. This deals with justification by faith apart from the law. The question that is being addressed here is the same question that was addressed in 2 Corinthians. And that is, there are attacks on Paul's doctrine, salvation by faith in Christ, apart from the law, being attacked by Judaizing teachers, and they have to attack his apostleship in order to get at the doctrine that they're after. And so he's already dealt with the apostleship, now we're dealing with the doctrine. So that's what this chapter is about, these chapters, chapters 3 and 4. So this is chapter 3 now. Um, chapter 3 deals with with justification by faith and not the law. What other book would you go to if you wanted to find another book, another book of the Bible, that is, uh, that addresses this same question other than, like 2 Corinthians addresses the apostleship more than Galatians does, but 2 Corinthians doesn't address this matter as much as another book. Romans, yeah, Romans. Uh, is much parallel in principle. Some of the phrases are much the same. Now, this is a kind of an unusual outline for me. I don't normally have this many points, but I think this is kind of how it falls out, at least in my mind, of chapter 3. He starts with a rebuke for, his, for their departure. We'll get to that in a second. In chapter 1, he was amazed at something before we get to that point about the departure. What was he amazed at? I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you and uh, to the grace and to another gospel. Then he's going to point out that you did, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or through faith? In other words, he's picturing living by the law of Moses, which the Judaizing teachers were arguing, or through faith in Christ. How did you get the Holy Spirit? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was it through the keeping of the law or uh, was it through uh, faith? Taking Abraham as an example, he was justified by faith and not by the law. He points out that if you go back to the law, you're under a curse. Points out the promise to Abraham was before the law, so they, uh, the promise of Genesis 12 had nothing to do with the law. And then he talks about the purpose of the law. <clears throat> and then we're ready to roll into chapter 4. So, let's get a couple of questions out of the way and then we'll uh, roll into chapter uh, 3. Question number 1. What was the example of Abraham and what does it prove? Yes, showing that he was justified by faith or considered righteous by faith, separate and apart from the law. We'll say more about that in a moment. Question number two, how many years before the law was the promise made to Abraham? Four and thirty years, the text says. Let's start with this rebuke for departure. He, he's quite severe, and I want to get ahead of myself to chapter 4 and verse 20. He seems to be somewhat exasperated in dealing with them uh, when he says, I have my doubts about you, I'm perplexed, in other words, the King James, America, I mean the American Standard and uh, English Standard versions. I'm perplexed of how to deal with you. He's kind of exasperated. I've taught you the gospel, you understood the gospel, you learned the gospel, and yet so quickly you've allowed these false teachers to lead you astray. Now, you just, just picture this for a moment. If you had taught somebody the truth about uh, the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, that's the day we're to take of it. You taught them that. You'd shown them that. They understood that. They knew it so well. You heard them teach it to someone else. And then within a year, you hear of them practicing the Lord's Supper on uh, Wednesday night. And you're amazed. So quickly, you, you went back and let somebody mislead you. How, how did this happen? I, I don't know what else to say to you than what I've already said. So let's get to verse 1. <clears throat> this is the rebuke. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? 
Uh, in other words, who has misled you? That's not a, the, the idea of, of bewitched is more than just being misled. It's used of witchcraft and trickery. Bedag suggests it has to do with, with, the, uh, with, with the eyes. In other words, who, who has deceived you with basically like witchcraft and, and has deceived you uh, with the, uh, for lack of better terms, with magic or with a trick? Who has tricked you, in other words, that you should not obey the truth before who eyes Jesus Christ was uh, clearly pro, uh, portrayed among you as crucified. I preached to you the truth, you understood the truth, and how could someone come along and trick you and mislead you so quickly and so soon? Now verse 3 and verse 4 continue that rebuke. We don't have time to go all, into all of that because I want to get to some things perhaps a little more weighty. So let's move to the next point here. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or through the hearing of faith? Now there's some question at verse 2 and verse 5. Are they talking about the same thing? I'm not convinced they are. But you may think so. And so let's, let's get to that. At verse 2, this only one do I want to learn. Did you receive the Spirit by the work of the law or by the hearing of faith? So what's he talking about receiving the Spirit? Some think in light of verse 5 he's talking about receiving miraculous gifts. This isn't the day of miraculous gifts, and I think verse 5 obviously deals with that. Um, I have no doubt about that. So they may be talking about the same thing. I want to think that verse 2 is talking about receiving the Spirit in the sense, some think it has reference to the indwelling of the Spirit, and if so, then that would harmonize with what I'm about to say. I, I, I prefer to word it as having fellowship with the Spirit. In other words, uh, you, you fed upon the revelation of the Spirit and you've entered into a relationship with God through that. I think that's basically what he's saying. So whatever you do with that, you receive the Spirit, you label that what you want, indwelling of the Spirit, miraculous gifts, or a fellowship with God. The question is, how did you receive the Spirit? Was it by going back and keeping the law? Or was it through obedience to Christ? And it's an obvious answer. Through Christ. Now let's go to verse, verse uh, 5. Uh, Therefore he who supplies the Spirit and works miracles among you. That makes me think he's talking about miraculous spiritual gifts of 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14. Perhaps a different aspect of the Spirit. Did he do it through the works of the law or the hearing of faith? In other words, how did you receive the miraculous gifts? Was it after you had obeyed the gospel, faith in Christ? Or was it going back and keeping the law and by keeping the law, you then receive miraculous spiritual gifts. Which was it? And their obvious answer, that's a rhetorical question because their answer is going to be through obedience to Christ. So we could stop at that point. We just lopped the chapter off at verse 5. He's made a pretty powerful point, hadn't he? He's trying to show you're justified by faith in Christ. That's the, that's the means of salvation and not by going back to the law like the Judaizing teachers are saying. All right, let's go further. Let's talk about the example of Abraham. What example is he talking about? There's a number of things about Abraham we could talk about, and, but he mentions one specific instance, what chapter, what place. What does he talk, what's he talking about? All right. And notice at verse, uh, b -b 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 verse 6, Abraham believed God and he was accounted to him for righteousness. That's parallel to Romans 4. That quotation is found in Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and he was considered a righteous man on the basis of his faith. All right? Now, that's it, verse, verse, uh, verse 6. Now, 7, 8, and 9, his point is, then if we're going to be like Abraham, it's those who believe who are the children of Abraham. Why does he mention Abraham? Why is Abraham? Why not pick another Old Testament example? All right, two points. You just made two points. Let's go back over those. Very good. One is, he was before the law, so that's a powerful example. If he'd have given an example after the law was given, that doesn't serve the point. But he's going back before the law, but more importantly than, than uh, equally important, not more important, but equal to that was, every Jew talked about their father Abraham. They claimed to be descendants of Abraham. They were descendants of Abraham. And Abraham is our father. Remember that John 8, never been in bondage to any man? 
How sayest thou ye should be made free? That was their defense. We don't, we're not in sin. We're children of Abraham. So he's showing your father that you trust in, or that, that the Jews trust in, your, your, their father, Abraham, was considered righteous before the law was even given. And that was through faith. Now notice it, verse 9, or verse 8. Um, 8 and 9. The scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith, that is Jew and Gentile, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you all nations of the earth will be blessed. Verse 8, that's Genesis 12. All right? So then those that are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So it's not those that go back to the law, it's those who have faith are like Abraham. So the Jews are saying, let's go back and keep the law. They're not like Abraham, it's those who have faith who are like Abraham, their father. Make sense? All right, let's go further. <clears throat> I know we're hurriedly going through this, but we've got chapter 4 to go yet. So now, what's the point here in 10 to 14? If you, if you want to go back to the law, do what? Keep the whole law. Somebody said something back here. Nobody's justified by that. The law came as a package deal. Would you agree with that? James 2.10. Which means that you don't just get any blessings the law might pronounce, but you get the curses that go with it. And that's the point he's making. So consider this. <clears throat> you, if you go back to the law, you're under a curse. Why? Because if you don't keep the whole law. Look at verse 10. He, he cites two passages. Verse 10, where does he quote? It's a quotation from Deuteronomy 27, in verse 26, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. So even Deuteronomy had said you had to keep the whole law. All right? The clincher is at verse 12, that a man which does those things shall live by them. That's found in, you need to be familiar with this verse. Leviticus 18, 5. All right. The point of Leviticus 18, 5 was the only way to be justified by keeping the law was to keep it perfectly. And if you kept it perfectly, you're not going to be saved from sin because you will have no sin. You kept it perfect, right? Did anyone except Christ keep it perfectly? No, so there's no way to be justified by the law. That's his point. So if, if you want to go back under the law like the Judaizing teachers tell you to, if you don't keep the whole law, you're under a curse. But we know we're under a curse because verse 11, and he quotes from another Old Testament passage that the Jews should have been. Now he's writing to Gentiles, keep in mind, but it's the Judaizing teachers who are trying to influence him. So these Judaizing teachers, their law, and where does he quote verse 11? From Habakkuk 2 and 4. What does it say? It's the... It's the this verse is quoted in Romans and becomes the theme of Romans. Yeah, the righteous person or the just shall live by faith. All right, so Habakkuk 2 said that the just will live by faith. We become just and right before God through faith. That's what Habakkuk prophesied. So we're saved by faith, so if you go back to the law, you're under a curse. That's another argument for being under the curse. So Christ came for this purpose, verses 13 and 14. Let's summarize 13 and 14, then move on. What's the point? Yeah. Christ came to redeem us from that curse. So if, all, if the only thing we had was the law of Moses, and Christ had not come, what's our condition now? We're lost, we're doomed, we're destroyed because... Even those that were saved under the Old Covenant was the basis of a coming sacrifice. Romans 3, 25, Hebrews 9, 15, etc. So his point is, Christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law. He was cursed for us, and we received the blessings of Abraham by faith. That is the blessing and the promise of Genesis chapter 12. Now, uh, let's go to verses 15 to 18 now. This gets back to Abraham and the powerful point about Abraham uh, so his point here is the promises to Abraham were before the law. Now this, this is a clincher point. Uh, 
if this were a sermon being delivered, when, and you heard Paul mention this, when he gets to his fifth point of his sermon, this is where it hammers down his powerful right here. So what's he trying to say here? Someone summarize in one sentence his point in 15 to 18, then we'll go back and look at the three points there. God made a promise or a covenant with Abraham, that promise and covenant was made before the law. And so therefore the law does not set aside the promise. That's the point. So let's get this, 17, uh, uh, 15 to 18. In verse 15, a confirmed covenant or promise, when God makes a promise, a confirmed covenant cannot be annulled or added to. Would you agree? All right, that's the point of verse 15. So God made a promise to Abraham, Genesis 12, verse 3, and you all nations of the earth would be blessed. And when that's been confirmed, and it is confirmed, then it can't be set aside. Now, man can make a promise, and then later it may be set aside and it's not fulfilled. This is a confirmed promise, and there's nothing that comes along that can set aside and annul that promise. Now, let's get the next point. The point is the promise came through Christ. How do I know it came through Christ? Abraham was the promise made, and God had said to Abraham in seed, singular, not seed. What's the point? Kind of a, seem a technical play on seed or seed. What difference does that make? Yeah, I'm talking about Christ. The promise is not that the, the, in your seeds, that is, through all the, the, the children of Abraham will be blessed. That's not the point. See, that would be plural. Meaning, if you're a descendant of Abraham and you're a Jew, you're going to be blessed. That's the way that the Judaizing teachers would present that. So it's not through seeds, but through seed, which has reference to Christ, according to verse 16. But as of one, that is to your seed, who is Christ. So the promise to, of Genesis 12 was through Christ, not through the descendants of Abraham. He's going to give evidence of that in chapter 4. Now, 17 and 18, his point is, the law came later. So look at verse 17. The law came 430 years later, cannot con annul our con uh, the covenant that was confirmed before God, uh, that is, that he's making the promise of non effect. So his conclusion is what? There was a promise made, Genesis 12, and then that promise cannot be broken, and the law had nothing directly to do with that promise being fulfilled, because it came later. Make sense? So those who are saying, oh, you've got to go back to the law, you've got to keep the law in order to receive the blessing of the promise, that promise had nothing to do with the law. That promise was made, and then the law came along later. So timing has everything to do with the promise and the interpretation of the promise. Now let's get to 19 to 29. Then, then why was the law given then? This, that would be a natural question, wouldn't it? What, what, then why didn't God just not even give the law? Well, the law had a purpose. So let's see what it was. The law was added because of transgression. What does that mean? To what? Because of sin. Now the law is the reason that there is sin. If there wasn't any law, there wouldn't be any sin, right? 1 John 3, Romans 4. So it's not saying man committed sin, so therefore God said, oh, we need a law now. But what it's saying is <clears throat> to reveal man's sin. That's what law does. Romans 3 is a parallel to this. So what purpose was the law? To reveal man's sin and to show that man is a sinner. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Without a rule book, you don't know what, what sin is, what, what's wrong, what, when have I violated the law of God. So it served a kind of a twofold purpose. One is to reveal sin, and it served as a deterrent to maintain some degree of purity for the bloodline. Leviticus emphasizes that point. So, but the point being emphasized here is that it's to reveal man's sin. It was added because of transgression <clears throat> until the seed should come. Now, verse 20 we don't have time. We could spend the rest of our time on verse 20. We, we can't do that. It's the most controversial verse in the book. 
One writer suggests that, there, that he has found 400 different interpretations of verse 20. We can't even mention all of them. So what is the point of verse 20? <clears throat> I'm not sure. But it, it focusing on the promise, now the mediator uh, is not a meter of, of one, but God is one. It may be emphasizing the, the, the simple fact that the law required a mediator and <clears throat> the promise does not, the promise was given directly. That may be the point being made. But the point seems to be that the law then doesn't set aside the promise um, because but the law only becomes secondary. I think he's emphasizing the point already made. But it's one of the most controversial verses. I suggest you look at H.A.W. Uh, um, Meyer, uh, look at um, uh, Willis. It kind of gives you a summary of that. Shaft, Philip Shaft, and others uh, will, will give you multiple interpretations of verse 20. It's a, it's a difficult verse. But it's focusing on the promise. Now let's drop down to verse 23. The law was to reveal sin, but it had another purpose. And what was it? To bring men unto Christ. It served as a tutor, schoolmaster, your King James will say. Uh, that had reference to a servant who oversaw children, a disciplinarian. So it doesn't matter so much what that is. I'm not saying that's not important. But the law was our tutor that would bring us to the point of Christ. And after that faith, the faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor. So it brings an end to the law of Moses. So the law had a purpose, to reveal sin, pointing men to Christ. <clears throat> let, me, let me footnote here. Romans 10, 4 is a powerful passage at this juncture. That Christ is the end of the law. <clears throat> Not talking about bringing an end to the law of Moses. Christ is the aim, the telos of the law. The law was pointing to Christ. Does that make sense? So the law was, the Old Testament was pointing to the Messiah. So it was to reveal the Messiah. <clears throat> But now his point is, in verses 26, 27, 28, and 29, let's summarize that and then get to chapter 4. What's his point? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we're all the sons of God by faith, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, and if you're Christ and you're Abraham's seed and you're heirs according to the promise. Now, that just set a pace for chapter 4, so let's get the picture. His point here is, <clears throat> the law was given to reveal man's sin, bring men to Christ, but now the law is gone, and now we're all, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, we're all one in Christ. And if you're, and if you're in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. You're an heir to the promise. And he just mentioned the idea of an heir. And so now that leads us to chapter 4. Now that's a quick summary of chapter 3. I know that. <clears throat> Questions or comments on chap <clears throat> chapter 3? Well, it doesn't say the word circumcision, but I think it's important for us to keep in mind that that's in Christ. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think you're right because chapter 2, if, we, if our connection is correct, that that's Acts 15, that was the whole issue of circumcision. So it, it does have to have that connection. Go ahead. I think you're right. Anything else? Chapter 3. Go to chapter 4. Now let's see if we can get a summary of chapter 4. I call chapter 4 freedom through Christ, but bondage comes through the law. And so his point is, he's just shown you're saved by faith in Christ, not apart from the law. But now if you go back to the law, you're in bondage. If you want freedom, it's in Christ. So that's the main point. So let's see if we can get that thrust right here. Three things are going to happen here. The first one is, that we're free, we're sons, and we're heirs through Christ. Remember, he just introduced heirs at the end of chapter 3. So let's see what he says. In verses 1 to 3, he describes that we were servants in bondage, that an heir, as long as he's a minor or a child, is no different from a slave. He's master of all. 
And, but we were under guardians and stewards. In other words, we were like a, a minor that's, that as an heir, but yet we, we were shut up and under bondage under the elements of the world. So his point here is that we were servants in bondage is what we were. But now, it's different. Now in Christ, what are we? When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons. And because you are, God sent forth his spirit, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I want to get to verse 7. So we're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, let's just talk uh, about this matter of, of the contrast. And the contrast is, under the law, we were considered, would be considered as slaves, would be like the minor, that's not an heir yet, but under the new law, we're as a son and we're an heir. So his point is that now through Christ, we are considered free, we're sons of God, and we're heirs through Christ. That's what we gain by obedience to Christ. Make sense? Look what we've gained through Christ. Now, the fullness of time, I'm just going to briefly touch on that, that Christ came in the fullness of time. What was so right about the time in which Christ came into the world. At verse 4, that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. It was the days of the Roman Empire. In other words, it seemed to be the right time. If it had been 2,000 years before or 2,000 years later, it may not have been the, but this was the perfect time for the coming of the Messiah. In the fullness of time, God picked, the, it was the right time because God picked it. Well, there was universal government, Rome. It was a period of peace. Travel was easier because of the universe, uh, universal government. There was universal language of Koine Greek. Koine, not just Greek, but Koine Greek, which means the meaning was locked in time. Does that make sense? So that while there is discussion sometimes, what does this word mean? It's not like a uh, fluctuating language that over a period of 50 years, it so changes. We can't figure out exactly how that word was used. Koine Greek, and that, I know that's a simplistic description, but it was locked in time. The meaning is locked. So, the, and the dispersion of the Jews, all of that made it conducive for the spread of the gospel, the rapid spread of the gospel, where before and after it may not have been the best, best time. So at the right time that God picked, God sent forth his son. All right. Now, that's verses 1 to 7. I know that's hurried. But his, now his point is, why go back into bondage? Tell me what this is about, 8 through 20. What's he trying to say here in 8 through 20? Yeah. Same principle. We may not be arguing with somebody about going back to the law today, but somebody who's living a life of sin, corruption, they come out of that, and then you ask them, why do you want to go back to the bondage that you were in? And so, but, but that's what he's saying here, that after you've known God and after you've become known by God, that's a whole concept within itself, uh, you, you served those that were by nature and no gods. You served idols. He's writing to Gentiles, by the way. And, and after, after you have known God, why do you want to go back to the beggarly elements and be in bondage again? Why would you want to do that? All right, that's point one. And why would you want to render my labor in vain? Verse 10 and 11. Now, the observing of days, months, and years probably has reference just to the Jewish customs. Why would you want to go back to the Jewish practices of like the Sabbath days and the new moon and the, the Passover and the Pentecost and the tabernacles and the years that they would observe would be like the sabbatical years, the year of Jubilee? Why do you want to go back and keep all those requirements of the law? And, and, and when you do, how does they render his labor in vain? Verse 11. Say that again. Good point. <laughs> yeah. In other words, it's like you're trying to free somebody from, uh, I like that expression, from the cage door. You're trying to free somebody from, from being in bondage, and you work yourself to death trying to get the door open. And once you get it open, they walk out and then walk right back in. Well, then all that work I was sweating and just working myself to death trying to get you out is, is, <laughs> is useless. And so you render my, my work in vain. 
And why go back to bondage and change your first attitude? What's his point here? 12 to 18. When he went to them first, how did they receive him? <clears throat> With open arms. Uh, they received him as if he were, verse 14, an angel. You treated me like I, uh, I was an angel. Uh, um, and that, in fact, they would have done what for him, verse 15? Some think, there's a footnote, that's testimony as we saw Thought some, some thought they saw in 2 Corinthians that Paul's problems were he had some eye difficulty, that you, since I have eye problems, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. In other words, all it's saying, though, is that you, you would have plucked out your own eyes for me. Your attitude toward me, you welcome me, you receive me, you embrace me as being from God. So if you go back to bondage, you're giving up that first attitude. What, what changed you? Who bewitched you? Remember chapter 3, verse 1? Now look at verse 17 to 20. He said, uh, they zealously court you, but not for good. Here's a practical lesson. Those who are after you, false teachers, will often court you. They will often, uh, nothing wrong with being zealous, but make sure it's for the right purpose. But it's not for your good. Yes, they want to exclude you separate you from something and I think that has a reference to they want to separate you from me because they're saying Paul's not a true apostle he's teaching his false they're trying to to put a wedge between me and you so they court you trying to I'm paraphrasing put a wedge between me and you that you may be zealous for them but it is good to be zealous in a thing and he said uh, not only when I'm present with you but he's zealous for them now, is his point. Now, verse 20, I would like to be present and change my tone, but, he said, for I have doubts about you. What does it mean, I have doubts about you? Anybody have the English standard? What does it say? I am perplexed about you. The American standard says the same thing. I think it's frustration. I'm, 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 I don't know. I taught you, and you welcomed me, and you embraced it, and you're so soon turned away, I, I, I don't know which way to turn to help do more than what I've already done. I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed. I'm perplexed. Now, we're not through. What else can I do? That's a good point. He is. Why well, go back to bondage? Now, there's an allegory here. What is an allegory? Melissa, you're the English teacher. Tell us an allegory. <laughs> All right, yes, it is an expanded figure of speech that, that is a, it's a, an expanded metaphor, basically. Um, and th it draws parallels from a true story. Here is something that, that's drawn. So let's see what the, here's the historical facts. Now our time is, we've got about five minutes, so I think we can do this in five minutes. He deals with historical facts, interpretation of the symbols, and application to the readers. So here's the story. Uh, Abraham had two sons, and what were, who were they? One was born to Hagar, and his name was Ismael. And the other was born Sarah, and his name was Isaac. All right, those are historical facts. Now the interpretation of the facts, here's the parallel that's drawn, which things are symbolic, that represents two covenants. So he's drawing a parallel and showing these are like the two covenants. And one from Sinai, and uh, then he talks about the Jerusalem that is from above, verse 26 and 27. Now, let's get to the application, 28 and 29, then I'm going to put a, a, a chart on the screen that um, will finish this off. That we are, as Isaac, are the children of the promise. Let's put this, this, this up first, and then that makes more sense. What he's saying is that Ishmael is, is a descendant of Abraham by Hagar is the bondwoman. Isaac by Sarah from a free woman. One was by flesh, the other one was by promise. Would you agree? One was in bondage, the other one was free. One persecutes, the other one is persecuted. One is not an heir, the other one is an heir. And his point is this represents two covenants. And the point is not the children of the flesh are children of the promise, 
but it's the children of the pro- I mean, that are heirs, but the children of the promise are heirs. Make sense? So what these Judaizing teachers are trying to get you to do is go back and keep the law and try to get you to become a Jew, be circumcised, become a Jew, so that you are children of the flesh, so you can receive the promise of Genesis 12. Oh, no, no, no. The children of the flesh is not the children of the flesh, but the children of the promise that are heirs. Illustrated with Abraham's children of Ishmael and Isaac. Both were descendants of Abraham. But one was by promise and the other was by the flesh. Make sense? Now, we could build a whole lesson around that, that allegory. But it illustrates from an Old Testament fact that it's not the children of the flesh, but the children of the promise that are heirs. He started on the note of heirs and he ends on the note of heirs in chapter 4. Does that make sense? So we've got a couple of minutes to go. Questions or comments? I know that's a hurried look at that if you don't have... Answer to question number seven, that's on the screen before you, right there. Those four contrast. It is, and intended to be. Right. <laughs> yeah. Paul, it's not beneath Paul to put a barb in somewhere where it needs to be. And it is an insult. Well, the, he's using their own argument against them, and they're arguing you have to be circumcised to be children of God, and that's their that's passed on from the Abraham, which means like nope. Very good, very good. Anything else? Questions or comments? don't want to lose sight of how this all fits with the, uh, the book. What we saw in chapters, let, let's summarize this and we'll be about done. Chapters 1 and 2 is the personal section where he's defending his apostleship. That I did not receive my apostleship from man, but, but, etc. I didn't receive my message from man, I received it from God, received the endorsement of the other apostles. Then here is the doctrinal section, we're justified by faith apart from the law. And so chapter 3 argues more of the point, but chapter 4 shows that if you won't go back to the law, you're in bondage. If you, we just got out of bondage, why do you want to go back? That's the argument in chapter 4. Make sense? Now then, chapters 5 and 6 is the practical section about how you live. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Now, practical living is based on doctrine. Because if the doctrine is not true, if the doctrine isn't true, then none of the practical living matters. Make sense? So we're about to get into that chapters 5 and 6. We'll stop right there and pick up at chapter 5 next time.